thank you for that beautiful song. Tonight we're talking about connecting the family, tying strings or fellowshipping, how to get a family that's tight, together, close. So just before we begin, let's just bow our heads once more because we want God's spirit with us. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we need you to bring your truth home to our hearts. And so we pray for your presence now and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the verse for tonight is John 17, verse 21 and 23, and it's very well known, but we want to apply it a little bit differently tonight. John 17, 21 says, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I am thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. that they all may be one, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And let's apply this to our families. God, Jesus was praying this with regard to his people, his disciples, but let's apply it to ourselves and our families, that they all may be one in your family, that you may all be one so that the world may believe. I and them and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So this verse actually spells out God's beautiful design for families, unity. Unity for a purpose, to show the world the love of the Father. So our work for God begins in our homes, with our families, not in the church. Our work for God begins at home. Adventist Home, page 32, says, one well-ordered, well-disciplined, and I'm going to add in brackets, connected family tells more in behalf of Christianity than all the sermons that can be preached. Powerful. One well-ordered, disciplined, well-disciplined family. The greatest evidence of the power of Christianity that can be presented to the world is a well-ordered, well-disciplined, and I'm going to add again, connected family. This will recommend the truth as nothing else can. For it is a living witness of its practical power upon the heart. In other words, God's word needs to change us. And the place it needs to change us is in our homes. Because that's where the real me comes out. It's easy to go out and pretend that we're something that we aren't. And we do that often. We come to church and we can pretend. We go to work and we can pretend. But at home we don't pretend. At home we are what we are. In fact, we're told that in God's eyes, a man is what he is in his family. A man or a woman, anybody, is what they are in their family. So tonight we want to take a look at how do we get connected families. Because today families are disjointed. Everybody's doing their own thing. And if they are together in the same house, they're all on their phones or on their technology doing something. And they're not together. And we need, if you want your kids to... To go out into the world and be strong, they need a strong home base. They need a strong connection with family members so that they can go out and start families of their own and learn how to be parents. So how do we gain true oneness and harmony? All right, point number one. This is going to be revision upon revision upon revision. <laughs> point number one, surrender. And I bet you could have guessed that by now. But it's each person within the family needs to be practicing surrender and actively fighting self. Because Christ in my heart will be in harmony with Christ in, his, in my husband's heart. And Christ in our hearts will be in harmony with the, 
Jesus in our children's hearts. This is true unity. Not let's huddle together and let's, you know, just be one. No, unity comes from each one of us surrendering ourselves to Christ. Adventist homepage 179 says the following. The cause of division and discord in families and in the church is separation from Christ. Full stop. The cause of division is because we separated from Christ. To come near to Christ is to come near to one another. The secret of true unity in the church and in the family is not diplomacy, not management, not a superhuman effort to overcome difficulties, though there'll be much of this to do. So we do need to manage, we do need to have diplomacy and all these things. But then she says, it's not those things, but union with Christ. That is what gives us unity. That is what gives us connectedness as a family. And that is why we began with this and we've been beating, beating it almost to death all week. <laughs> surrender, 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 surrender. Because that is where the power lies. That is where the unity lies. That is where your connectedness lies. Now, you can't teach that to your kids unless you've done it, been practicing it yourself. As parents, we need to be practicing to surrender. We can't say to our kids, you need to surrender your heart when we aren't. We've got to be practicing it ourselves. So we've got to come to that understanding and begin making it a reality. And only then can you teach it to your children. Okay, so the concept of surrender or, or of connecting the family and parenting. The bottom line that we've shared with you, Steps to Christ 47, 48, Surrender in my heart in the moment throughout the day. We're not talking about just baptism and just when I choose to give my life to God. It's moment by moment surrender. Remember Jen said, we need to be actively each member of a family. And that, gentlemen, is our responsibility. We are the priests of the home. And, and I hope that this concept stays with you. If there's anything that you remember from this whole week, and it's, it's this concept, that we need to be surrendering to Christ throughout our day and teaching our children, holding each other accountable, being a support group. Okay. Number two of bringing the family together is parental example. The relationship between the husband and the wife is the primary relationship in the family, yes or no? Yes. Correct. And... Just as a side note, we must be careful that we don't become um, child-centered child -centered in our families and ignore this relationship. Mm. That is a big mistake that many, many families make today. We focus so on everything is around the little kid that this relationship actually suffers and is destroyed. You take the base away for the family structure. Mm. So if this relationship is not functioning properly, it trickles down to the rest of the family and it causes havoc in the home. Mm. We cannot hope to have unity and harmony in our families if we as parents are not in harmony. Mm. And that is why we said over the weekend, marriage is not just about being together. It's about harmony. It's about joy. It's about oneness. It's about friendship, connectedness. Mm. It's about Christ living in her heart and Christ living in my heart. We really need to ask ourselves a question as parents. What is the emotional climate in our home? What does our home feel like? What does it look like? And not just from your perspective. We actually need to climb into our children's shoes and look at it from their perspective. Is home a happy place? Does daddy really love my mommy? And does daddy show it? Mm. Because that in itself brings in um, a warmness and a, a togetherness in the family. Remember, Dads decide generally what direction the family takes. But oh, the mothers decide how everyone feels about the journey. <laughs> That's so powerful. <laughs> you know, God has given men the position, but these precious creatures carry the power. <laughs> and, and, yep. and it's so true in this sense. We generally can, and you know, we're not being specific now, but you get the feel of it. 
Mommies make the place feel good. Or bad. Correct. <laughs> so, are you, as a couple, pulling in different directions in your home? And I understand that if you are not equally yoked with your, with your spouse, that that probably could very well be the case. So even if you are equally yoked, it can also be the case. We cannot force anybody to come onto our pathway and onto our mind of thinking. But I want to tell you that if you are on your own, you've got all heaven behind you. Because heaven knows that you need special help in a, in a divided situation like that. And I believe that heaven will give it to you mm. if we just cooperate with him. Okay, so how do we get this harmony? We're speaking about harmony. I've got a few bullet points. We have learned and are still learning to surrender self to God. Remember our quotes over the weekend. The battle of self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. And that when we do overcome self, we save ourselves a thousand troubles. It is such a powerful statement and it really needs to catch us between the, my, between the eyes. So essentially to, be, to have harmony in the home, we need to move from being self-managed to be God-managed. Under God, not under my own power, not under my own adrenaline, not under my own ideas, my own intellect, but under God. Number two, seeking to make the spouse in the home, your spouse, the happy, the happiest that he or she can be, and not focusing on myself. I, I honestly, and it needs to begin this way, when you wake up in the morning, Lord, how do you want me to treat my queen today? What can I do for Jen? Simple. Have that in your thinking. How can I serve this creature that you've ordained me to serve? Only me. Show me how to meet her needs today. Thirdly, we need to have open communication. We need to talk. We have no secrets between us. And it's, it is so special that we don't. We have learned to be willing to be vulnerable with each other. With each other. It's tough. When you start dealing with self and with the deep, yucky things that come deep within and start scratching out your backstory, it requires vulnerability. Mm. But there's no better way to bring the bond deeper and bring the harmony. It really builds love. We need to strive to understand one another's heart. Not just get things done. Not just get through the day and go to sleep at night and pay the bills. Understand each other's heart. If we're not understanding each other's heart, we're missing out of each other. We're just together because of our marriage contract. Mm. Matthew 15.10 says, Jesus speaking, And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. That is key to communication in your home. Hear and understand. Don't just hear. We need to be understood. Um, bullet number five or four, one, two, three, four, five. One of my favorites. <coughs> and I can tell you now, he has, a, he has an advert for marriage. One of the best things that you can do, gentlemen, in your marriage is slot a specific time out in your day, wherever it's going to suit your schedule. And I know our schedules are full. But set time out for chat time with your wife. That is half an hour or whatever you can, you can spare. At least half an hour. Where you come together, you take off your work hat, you take off all the things, empty your troubled soul, and you focus on your queen in the context of what's going on inside there. What are you thinking today? How are you feeling? I tell you, it took a, it took a lot of practice to learn to do that because when you come out of work and, you, and uh, we chose to do just before lunch, so I would stop my work early and come home and spend half an hour with her and it's really hard when you're busy and you've got trouble on the farm and you know everybody's phoning you and your business mind is running and you've got challenges it's a challenge to come off and switch off and to switch on but i promise you it pays hands down there were a few times that i came home that i failed that i ended up um just giving her solutions to all of her, her issues and her problems where she just wanted to be understood and heard but i eventually got it right i got it right sometimes most, um, most of the time. Most of the time. <laughs> but I really, 
I, I really cannot emphasize this enough. You take time to really talk. Not chat about the weather. Um, not plan next week's trip to town. You're talking about deeper things. And what it did for her was it, it set in her heart the understanding and always the knowing that I, if somebody comes up in a day that she wants to speak to me about or that's there, she knows I can speak to Rich tomorrow at 1 o'clock. She's got an opportunity. Mm. What we did with this too, having small kids in the home, we had a rule. When the bedroom door is shut and we have in swing time or chat time, you don't come and knock on the door or mommy or daddy unless somebody's busy dying. And only then. <laughs> so if the cat is getting, uh, or the dog is biting the cat, let it bite the cat. You know what I mean? We do not, we set the rule in place. And I promise you, when life is busy and your children are small, it sets mom and dad time out of schedule and you know you're not going to be interrupted. It was precious time. That requires, though, uh, well, some well-disciplined kids. Oh, no, ab absolutely. Um, you, you know, if you tell your children that you're not going to come to the door unless they really have to, then you need to make sure that that's they what don't. they do. <laughs> Correct. Okay. Positive conflict resolution. We found very early in our marriage that we need to set a thing in place where some rules of engagement when you have a disagreement, because disagreements are part of life. You're going to have it. We're two different people, and we're going to have disagreements. So we actively spoke about our um, conflict resolution rules. We call them rules of engagement, and we chose to stick to that. One of the, one of the rules, uh, or I can maybe mention one or two of them, but the, the most important one is that if you are in a point of conflict and you're getting heated, each, anyone has the, has the, the um, right to call a timeout. Now, timeout doesn't mean that's the end of it, we never go back there. Timeout means we take a break and we come back to it at another time. When we both cool Correct. down. So that you don't sweep your issues under the carpet, but you deal with them, but mm. in the right spirit. So if it's a timeout, it could be timeout for five minutes to go separate ways and just surrender. Even a monkey run. <laughs> <laughs> Send, Chris. send yourself on a monkey run. <laughs> Brilliant. Chris has been listening. The point being that you get yourself back connected with, with God, and then you can come back and have a constructive um, resolution to your conflict. Um, I can tell you these few points and some others really brought harmony and joy into our home, and especially to this relationship. Mm. So when striving for a connected family, we as parents need to set the right example. We need to be what we wish our children to be. It's as simple as that. If mom and dad are fighting and arguing, how can we expect our kids not to? Mm. And you, you, you won't believe how often this happens in our homes. Mm. It's just so logical. And then we wonder why our children turn their backs on our religion. It's a tough one to swallow, but it's the truth. Child Guidance 218 says, It is because so many parents and teachers profess to believe the word of God while their lives deny its power. Mm. Listen to me. Denying its power is denying steps to Christ 47, 48. I hope we can put the link. The power of God is not just this magnificent supernatural power that's up in heaven and that it just somehow magically transform your heart and we walk with Christ forever or after. No, the power of Christ is that power that is waiting for me to call on, Daryl, when I'm frustrated, when I'm angry, and when I'm irritated in the moment. That's what it means to live and not to deny the power of Christ. Let me just read the, the quote in, in, in um, in, in one go, it is because so many parents and teachers profess to believe the word of God while their lives deny its power that the teaching of scripture has no greater effect upon the youth. Mm. So we can pump the scripture. We can push them through Bible studies. But if our lives are not exhibiting the power of victory, 
our example, our whole exercise is futile. Serious, serious statements that we have before us. Okay, point number three is order and regularity. Now remember, if I told you how I got to the point where I was feeling like I'm going to snap, I'm going to go mad because my kids were just completely out of control. And I got to the point where I said, Lord, just do whatever it takes, but show me what I must do to get to restore sanity to this home because I am going crazy. And one of the first things that God showed me was order and regularity. Now, for what I used to do was, I just used to leave stuff. Like, I, I would pile my laundry on the spare bed for days until I had a mountain of it, and then I had to deal with it all. I'd leave the dishes in the sink. I'd, I, would, I would leave the toys all over the lounge floor because my thinking was, well, what's the point of tidying it up at the end of the day? Because tomorrow they're going to tip it all out anyway. So all I did was I would just clear a path so that I wouldn't stand on the Lego in the middle of the night. You know how you, yeah, I'm sure you've done that before. And so that's all I did. And God began to point out to me, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40, let all things be done decently and in order. Mm. Tidy up, keep your place orderly. And you know what? I began to do that, and immediately there was peace in my home. I was amazed at the difference it made. My peace of mind, my children's peace of mind, I felt like my brain, my mind was way less cluttered I could think more clearly, which means I can hear God's voice speaking to me more easily, because simply because I picked up the toys, yes, I picked up the toys and I washed the dishes and I did the laundry, folded the laundry every day instead of once a week. It made a huge, huge difference to the atmosphere of our home and my calm, calmness, which means that when I'm calm and restful, I'm going to deal with my kids in a different way. I'm going to treat them with more patience. I'm going to be more understanding instead of, no, 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 which is what I was doing. And of course, the way I treat them flares them up and makes them behave just like I was. Irritated, mm. impatient, uh, and then they're at each other. And I'm wondering, what's wrong with these kids? They're just terrible kids. It was me. So God began to teach me gospel order, a tidy, orderly home, comes before working for and helping others. And I've heard stories of people, of mothers who go out and they're helping everyone else, but their home is chaos, total chaos. It begins at home. We need to have a solid, sound base in our homes. I came across this quote that really spoke to me. It's from um, Mind, Character, and Personality. One, page 111, interesting. It says, irregularity has created disorder in your house. This was written to a housewife. And if continued, will cause your mind to sink into imbecility. I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the edge of imbecility. <laughs> it was just very clear. You know, when you, when you pray and you say, Lord, do whatever it takes, God says, yay, now we can do some work. <laughs> He says, okay, yeah, 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 these are your mistakes, fix them, and you'll be okay. I was like, okay, Lord, I'll, do, I'll work on it. And it made a huge, huge difference to our lives, huge. So we had a schedule, we had set times for things, we had tidy up time every day where we tidied up the toys. I taught my kids how to start tidying up because I hadn't been teaching them to tidy up their toys. I was just teaching them, leave it, doesn't matter. So by not training them, I was training them. Um, I was training them to be messy instead of tidy. And that created security, stability, and harmony. Because everybody knows what's happening next, and we know we go to bed at this time, and we know we're not allowed to get out of bed after this time. And just, it makes a huge, huge difference to just the peace and the harmony in the home. Number four, we need to be busy tying strings. We need to tie strings that bind us together as a family. We need to spend time tying strings of fellowship with our children. And you need to ask God how you want to do that. We can give you some examples. Their hearts must be bound to ours in love. We must win their admiration. Okay? We, we need to earn the right to rebuke. Do you get that? 
We need to earn the right to rebuke and be a living example of what we expect our children to be. Now, there's something that we need to understand. Children spell the word love like this. T-I-M-E. Time. That's how love is spelt in a child's mind. Time with mommy and daddy. Now, I've heard parents say, oh, I spend quality time with my kids. Oh, yes, yes. Well, let me just blow your little bubble for you. You see, when daddy has time to spend quality time and he uh, diarizes in his book, Johnny may not be interested in spending quality time with dad. Mm. You see, Johnny and Sally needs time with dad over a period of time and with mom. So what you're saying then is quality time happens within quantity time. Correct. You can't switch on the quality time switch in your children's mm. needs. Are we together? I know this is a tough one for us because life is busy, but you know what, folks? We need to make some choices. And this is what tying and binding your family together is going to involve. It's making choices, difficult choices. That brings us to the next point. We have to prioritize. I promise you, I got into big trouble with my father. I told you the other day of some of the pressures that I was under working under my father. But I broke the rules of work. I mean, when I was a kid, growing up all through high school, we'd work from sunrise to sunset and no deviation, I promise you. In summer months, it would be 5 o'clock until 7.30. Mm -hmm. I can remember in the drought, that's a long day. You come in, you've got no time for anything. We as, as kids, high school kids, we just hit the sack and you just keep until the next morning. That's they not didn't even life. Bath. That's not life. You cannot live like that. Mm. Life is more than work. Mm. Life is more than, than what's, what you regard as valuable. Mm. We really need to ask ourselves, what is the most important to you, especially in the context of where we live in as Adventists? You see, we find ourselves sitting in these pews, but we're still allowing life to dictate to us how we must live. And we sometimes transfer our work, work, and our get up and go, but we work, work for God. I'll do Bible studies. I've got to convert the world, but my family is longing for dad's attention. Mm. What is the most important to you? Is it your work? Is it your hobbies? Is it even the church or ministry? You know, I've heard it said, and this is so true. It is easier to work for God than it is to submit to him. Chew on that for a minute. Mm. It's easier to work for God and do his work than it is to submit to him in the moment. That is why we throw in steps to Christ 47, 48 you the whole week. Steps to Christ 47, 8 is the basis for true Christianity. Is Christ living himself out in me in the moment. So, do you as a father have the right to come home after a long day's work and park in front of the TV because I'm tired? Who made you tired? Maybe your choices did. This may be a bit tough and it may be a bit unfair, but we need to make a decision. Because I can promise you, when your children grow up and they've lost your input, you can't work to make it up. It's gone. Mm. It's gone. Mm. There have never been people on their deathbeds that have ever said, I wish I worked more in my company. They've always said, every time, always, I wish I gave more to my people. I wish I was more for my family. The use of your time shows where your priorities lie. We have to cut out things that get in the way of spending time with our families. Give up the good for the best. Believe you me, the devil is very happy keeping us so busy doing good that we have no time for what is best. We need to determine what is that best versus that good. If you've been jinxed, it's your choice to become unjinxed and choose to go the other way. So some practical ways of tying um, strings. Delight in your children. Show a happy face 
show appreciation, show approval. Enjoy your children. Delight in the things that they delight in. Psalms 149 verse 4 says, For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. Let's take pleasure in our children. And I can tell you something, if you're struggling to take pleasure in your children, you have a discipline issue. Discipline your children, and then you can have pleasure in them. Remember Jane said the other night, she loved her kids dearly, but she didn't like them. Mm. That's true. We sometimes love our husbands or our spouses, but we don't like them. Mm. Why? These issues, sort your issues out. If God takes pleasure in us, his people, then surely we need to take pleasure in our children. It's a no-brainer. Okay. A smile will give you power with your kids. Morning, my son. I'm glad to see you. Rather, morning. Grab a hot dog or, or a, uh, no, a hot dog, um, a scone and you're out the door. Like a sunflower turns its face to the sun, a child will turn to anyone who smiles at him. Are you the one smiling at him or are they getting only frowns and negativity from you? Mm. You may say there's nothing to smile at them about. They're brats. <laughs> and that's, that may be true. But here's the problem. <laughs> Whose fault is that? Hey now, ouch, I know, I know we're treading on our toes tonight. But these are the things that we need to face. These are the things that we need to do. We need to confess, folks. We need to pray and we need to work so that we can delight in our children. We cannot take this parenting thing for granted. Don't wait for them to change before you start smiling at them. A sapling grows up to the sunlight, not because of pressure put on it. The sun doesn't push it from underneath. It draws it. Mm. Frowning and negativity do not motivate change. And we've been speaking the whole week about getting to the heart. We want to get to the heart. Look into your children's eyes and smile at them. Let them see your approval. Let them see that you are genuinely wanting to be in their presence. Child Guidance 146 says, Children are attracted by a cheerful, sunny demeanor. Oh, and that's, this statement has been my axe in the middle of my head. Because I was under so much pressure and I was not a cheerful, sunny, demeanored father many times. Children, um, Child Guidance 147, children hate the gloom of clouds and sadness. Their hearts respond to brightness, to cheerfulness, and to love. And you know what? If our lives are difficult like mine was, I was learning to surrender, and only as I was getting it right was I able to succeed. But that's why we need to surrender. Because if, if work is pressuring you, pressuring you, and whatever the outside pressures are, it's not fair that we take it out on little innocent children. And it's the easiest, and this, this freaks me out, it's the easiest to take it out on our children. They're the most innocent and they're the most frail. If you take it out on her, you can get lip. If you take it out on your kids and they give you lip, then, you know, don't get cheeky. Mm. We, we, we are authority. We are power over our children, mm. and yet we abuse them. We really, we need to take our struggles and our difficulties to God. This is why we need to learn to surrender in the moment. So smile. Sometimes it feels your face may crack, but it doesn't matter. Smile anyway. <laughs> you know, about, it was about eight years ago when I was actually preparing this very message to, to present somewhere else. Um, I was up very early in the morning and actually Ashley was 15 years old. She's now 23 and married and left home, but she was 15 at the time, and she, she peeped around the curtain at me, and I grinned at her, and I waved. Early in the morning, it was still dark, and she came r rushing into the room, and she said, she came to me, and she gave me a kiss and a hug, and she said, I couldn't resist your grinning little face. That's what my 15-year-old daughter said to me. I, found, I thought that was a privilege, Amen. that she would feel that way about me. I felt so privileged because how many people's 15-year-old daughters are like, oh, my mom, you know. Old hag. Yeah, they don't want anything to do with their mothers. And my child was happy to be with me and she loved me. That was 
I was, I was blown away by that. Simple little thing, but I was blown away by that. And the, it's the power of looking them in the eye and enjoying them and saying, I think you're great. Mm. Even if they're not great. But you know what? The reality is if they're not great, that's our job. To work and help them to be it's great. It's our God-ordained privilege to help our children through the power of Christ to become great. Mm. So if our children are not great, we need to look at ourselves. We need to bring them to Steps to Christ 47, 48, 48 and give them the tool. Okay, number two in tying strings. Invest yourself in your children. Give time to teach them things. Like we told you last night about our youngest son who broke so many windows and we taught him, Richard taught him how to fix a window. He's now a really good window fixer. I mean, he can put a window in better than, he, than Richard can. Um, that's invest in yourself, in your child. Um, teach your kids how to cook, your girls and your boys. I taught my boys how to make some basic breakfast meals and they enjoyed making those meals and they, it gave them some independence too. Right now, they're at home. They've been at home for, by the time we get home, it'll be almost a month and they've been cooking for themselves and taking care of themselves. I left food in the freezer, basic things, but they've had to put meals together for themselves and it's not a problem for them. Um, we taught our kids to to cook and bake and drive the tractor, do woodwork, fix windows, all sorts of things. Another way of investing yourself in your children is answer their questions. Mm. And so often we're like, oh, quiet now, too many questions. I'm busy, I'm thinking, I'm working. I'm... Take the time to sit down and answer their questions. That's investing yourself in them. The context of that point was, it, it, it was a very real one for me because when we would go to cattle sales, cattle sales out of 10, 2, 3 in the year, they were highlights for our, that was our business highlights for the year because that's when you get your income. So cattle sales were either very positive experiences or very Negative. terrible experiences <laughs> because of the prices or you come home with half your animals and you haven't sold them. So generally, um, cattle sale time on their way home, my mind is spinning. You've been talking to other farmers, your brain is full of stuff that, you know, you don't interact with them and, until you're at the sale. So on the way home, I've got a lot of processing to do. And then, Daddy, why is that tree brown over there as you're driving <laughs> across? <laughs> Daddy, what's the, um, how strong is that truck? And, <laughs> and so you get all these questions. And, you know, at one point I wanted to tell my kids, oh, man, just shut up. I'm just <laughs> tired. You know, that's what you feel like telling them sometimes. But in the moment, I chose, I chose to put my business on place and I chose to answer their questions. And I can tell you how one son, he's 21. Almost. And, o almost. <laughs> he's still got such a question in mind. But I tell you what, that boy has got such a broad knowledge. It's unbelievable. He will come and tell us things and we say to ourselves, where on earth did he get that from? So invest in your children. Answer their questions. You know what? For those of you that your children are really out of the home, we will agree. They're very quickly out of our homes, are they not? Mm. It goes just like this. And you never get an opportunity to answer those questions again. Mm. So give to your children while you have them because they're not there forever. That, that questioning child, he, he, you know, they go through the why stage at like three years old. Well, he never outgrew that why stage. It just carried on forever and it hasn't ended. Thankfully, he's now asking his questions on Google and he's researching <laughs> for himself. It's not so much daddy because daddy is, he's now outdone daddy. So. <laughs> I just want to come back to investing in your children, this thing of Ryan fixing windows. Um, but a week or two before we left to come on this trip, um, it wasn't really his fault. You know, he, put his, he pushed the window open, but the window's kind of stiff and the the glass just went, so I said, cool, Peanut, there's a piece of glass in the workshop, um, you know, just replace it for me. Sure, Dad, and so he did it, and the one day when I came back, he'd done it, and I walked past there, the window was in, and I looked, the glazing was absolutely, um, for those of you that have ever done a window, if you, if you don't really know what you're doing, <laughs> the harder you try and put that putty in, it just comes out after you can't, but he got it really well done, but I noticed that he never cleaned up. He put the putty knife away and stuff, but all the bits were still lying there on the ground. And, you know, I, I went up to him and I grabbed him by the back of the neck and I said, um, my son, you, the window looks really good, but I see you haven't cleaned up. You know, is there a problem? He says, yes, Dad, there is a problem. He says, the little bits of putty that are lying all over the place, 
are soft and sticky. They stick in everywhere. I'm just waiting for them to dry and I'll clean it up tomorrow or the next day. Boom. <laughs> Between the eyes I said, thank you, my son. At least you were thinking. Invest in your kids. When you invest in them, you see the rewards. When they start thinking for themselves, it is so rewarding. So, you know, I wanted to say to him, but go and clean up. No, Dad, I don't want the putty to get stuck and just smear and get Mom's little broom all full of putty. Mm, so, thank you. Ten points for him. He's thinking. Number three, we need to move on. How do we, what are we talking about? Tying strings. Tying strings. Number three, family worship. Family worship is non-negotiable. And if I'm treading on your toes, I'm not going to apologize. I want to encourage you. We must have family worship. Family worship, morning and night, it's special time. It's time that you connect with your children. It's time that you bring them before the altar. We are the priests of the home and we need to lead out. And when you have family worship, don't just go through the motions. We bore our children if we do that. If you're going to read a, a Bible verse, make it practical. But we learned that what you have to do in family worship is read something that is applicable to the youngest in your home. Mm. You can't go to um, a great controversy when your children are three and four. Mm. It's going to mean nothing to them. So we know the red books and the blue books back to front <laughs> because we read the blue books for years waiting for Ryan to catch up. But I want to tell you something. Waiting and, and focusing on the youngest one has paid hands off. Because the, as soon as we moved from the blue books, we went straight into Desire of Ages and... Patriarchs and Prophets. Patriarchs and Prophets. And we've read those books. Just recently, we've done Great Controversy. It's such a blessing. Every morning, every, you just read two or three pages. It speaks volumes. Mm. And we got them each their own copy, and they would underline with us as we would read through, and we'd speak about things. It's really a, a special time. Call for your children's attention. When you're having worship, if Johnny's starting to look over there and whatever, Johnny, listen to Daddy. Look at me in my eyes. What did Daddy just say? What did Jesus do with the fishies? And get them engaged. Keep them engaged. You don't just want to give them a form of religion. And as they start getting older, you show how the Bible speaks to surrendering of self, Christ living in me. We don't just want to be able to sing that Jesus loves me. Jesus' love must come out in me. Okay, point number four is family time. And this is where you do fun stuff together. Um, children love to play, and they love it when you, the parents, play with them. So we did stuff like playing blind man's bluff. Um, we read together. We read loads and loads of books. We talked during family time. Um, with, uh, family time was a scheduled time in our day that we spent half an hour with our kids doing stuff geared towards them and binding us together. So we would go walking. We would go swimming in our reservoir in summer. We even occasionally took out our inner tubes, our big tractor tubes, down to the river and crossed the river on them and enjoyed our time with, on the river with that. We sometimes go out and burn piles of bush that have been pushed out on our farm. Um, the bush gets pushed out and left to dry, and then we go and at night light it, and we have this huge bonfire. I mean we still do that. The fire is so big, it lights up the hills around. And, of course, the, for at night, you know, for a kid, this is just amazing. Think. Do amazing things. Do natural things with your children. Yeah, and just remember, TV is not family time because you're not connecting during that time. Make it something that you're doing as a family together that binds you together. Um, another thing that we did was we had, I had chat time with each child once a week. They would get half an hour. So I had three kids. So it was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday nights. I, I spent half an hour with each child not with each child, but each child had a night that was theirs. And on that night, uh, we, we would talk. I would give them a foot massage or a back massage, or I'd read them a special book that they were wanting to read. I would play games with them or do projects with them. That was their individual time with me. And they never failed to remind me, hey, Mom, it's my chat time tonight. Hey, Ma, it's my chat time tonight. What are we going to do? 
And it was, it was something they looked forward to. It was something that b b um, bonded us together. And it, gave, it didn't always give opportunities to talk about serious things, but there were times when we did. And remembering, like Richard said, quality time happens within quantity time. Yeah. So s suddenly one day your kids will just open up and want to talk, and you're there. Yeah. Be there and, and make yourself available for them. Child Guidance, page 148, says, you must win their affection, your children's, if you would impress religious truth upon their heart. You must win their affection if you want to impress them with your religion and the truth. So we need to take the time to draw out what is in our children's hearts and listen to them so that we can impress upon them what we want to impress upon them. Okay, Adventist Home, page 192 and 193, says this. If the children do not find in their parents and in their home that which will satisfy their desire for sympathy and companionship, they will look to other sources where both mind and character may be endangered. So if you are not the one that's satisfying that need for companionship, they're going to find it somewhere else. And that, that may be dangerous. And it, and it inevitably ends up with a boyfriend or a girlfriend. As they get older, that's where it will go. She carries on and she says, throw around your children the charms of home and of your society. If you do this, they will not have so much desire for the society of young associates, friends. They won't have that desire as much. Because of the evils now in the world and the restriction necessary to be placed upon the children, parents should have double care to bind them to their hearts and let them see that they wish to make them happy. The devil has redoubled his efforts yeah. to get our kids. He's more than redoubled. He, I don't know, he's 10 times, a million times. He is after our kids and we cruising along thinking that everything's fine. We need to be redoubling our efforts to, to hold on to our kids. And that means we've got to be sociable with them. We've got to spend time with them. Be that friend to them. Play with them. Get into their hearts and figure out, find out what is going on with them. That will bind their hearts to you. If you want a motivation, by the way, just to get your mind focused to what the devil is really doing with our children, go and read the chapter in Great Controversy called um, The Snares of Satan. I think it's chapter 32. There, Spirit of Prophecy tells us how that he redoubles his efforts to keep our minds so busy and so occupied. He's speaking to you and me, but he's also speaking to our children. Okay, number six, work together. Mm. Tackle hard things. Gardening. They must learn that when those back muscles burn because you're working with a spade, it's actually good for you. But you must be there with them. You must be there with them. Mm. Work with your family. Do difficult things together. You see, getting really connected happens when you face challenges together as mm. a family. It doesn't just happen because you're just always together. You, we need to do sometimes hard things. Encourage your family to be a team, all working towards the same goal. Um, a harmonious, smooth running home doesn't just happen. We need to encourage it. We need to build it. Everyone in our home has chores. Mommy doesn't do all the dishes. In fact, <laughs> we have, we sh Jane shared with the other night, Jaden actually said to mom the other day, mom, when you wash a dish, you should wash it on the backside too. And he said, um, yeah, I have a right to say that to you because I've washed more dishes than you have in this house. And it's true. <laughs> Our children shared the chores. They did their share of the chores. My children helped me big time on the farm. In fact, for about eight months, I had uh, one staff member and for about three months, not nobody on the farm with me. And I was running 500 head of cattle. Me and my kids did it. And they worked. My children, you would walk, would bring cows home to farm. And our farm was 6Ks long, it was a long, narrow farm. We'd bring some cows home to calve. And then after lunch, the cows had, whose calves were already two, three weeks old, they could go back to the far felt. They would go back after lunch. And I mean, our kids were small. And you know what? My kids still talk about it. Mm. Those were tough days, but they talk about those days as their best days. Walking after those cattle in that hot sun, in the dust, you could hardly breathe, but they learned to work. They learned to struggle. It really, 
it really gave them value and self-worth. Remember, they were needed. work gives a child self-worth and value because mm. they realize that they need it. And I let my children know, thank you for helping daddy today. I would never be able to do this work without you. We would change camps and we would dip and we would inject. We would do the whole lot with my children. It was a great time. I went with them once. I didn't often get to go and work with them on the farm because when the kids were with Richard, I was at home doing everything I didn't get time to do because I was so busy homeschooling. So there were occasions I did go with them. And one day I went with them, they were doing, you were doing samples and ear notching, which is they clip, clip a tiny piece of the cow's ear out of it, put it in a test tube, and it gets sent away. And what were we testing for? I can't actually Something. remember now. It was some, it was some disease that we had, to, we had to test for. So we were, doing the, we were weighing the cattle, we were clipping ears and keeping track of all this paperwork and everything, and we, all of us were working together, and the kids said to me at the end of that day, wow, mom, it was so nice to have you there today. That was the best cattle weighing day we've had. Just because I was there joining in with them and helping it makes a huge difference when you work together as a family, and we all felt, we all felt connected after that. We felt like we'd, we'd accomplished something together, and that's what binds you. We did some great fun things together too that also challenged us. We went to the Richtersveld. Um, uh, when was that that we went there? 2011. Yeah, 2011. Our kids were sort of middle teenagers and, and young, younger. And we spent 12 days in the Richtersveld. And what a blast it was. Absolutely nothing. I swear that's where Moses was in the wilderness. <laughs> it was a place that looked just like that. And... But halfway through, we decided to climb Tatasberg, which is the highest m mountain peak in the area. Now, that is just a mountain of just boulders. huge boulders. I mean, mm. there were boulders the size of this church there. There was, and w we really had to scramble, and it was really a challenge to get up there. And there were many times that the kids wanted to turn around and go back, and our, our bucky was down there in the valley. You could see just a little size of an ant. It was so high up, and we'd have to sit down and say, well, okay, let's just take a rest. Do you really think it's worth us going back down now? Look, the top, you know how when you're on a mountain, the top looks like it's just over there. <laughs> In the meantime, it's a pretty long way. Well, I would say to them, look, the top is just there. Let's keep going. And we did that two or three times up the mountain where we, we had to make a decision. Are we bailing or are we going to stick through? There were tears. Let me tell you, there were yeah. tears. And I sat there and I was feeling bad. Yeah, Lord, you know, am I pressing my kids too hard? You know, is this torture or what? Man, I tell you what, when we got to the top and the view was so beautiful and the way down, they were so happy. That has been a milestone in our family's life. We conquered Tatasberg. Mm, together. Together as a family. Mm. And Jen has already spoken about crossing the, the river on tubes. I mean, the Bushman's River, which is nearby us, is a quite a fast-flowing river at the, at the mouth. And if you don't get it right, you're going to end up in the rocks on the other side or even out to sea. And we had just a few uh, tubes and we had our, our dog with us. So we had to work out a way of getting across there and we had to plan it and we threw something in to see how fast the water's going. And man, we got across and only just got across. And then we had to come back again in the afternoon and reverse the whole process. We did fun things together and we involved things. them, challenged them. Mm -hmm. So to tie the hearts of your family together, means sacrifice time to do things that really matter. You know what we really need to do is give up doing the good and focus on doing the best. Mm. Prioritize. We do just before we conclude, we do want to warn you of a few things that will definitely erode your connectedness. I'm going to end off on a negative note, but we have to mention these to you. And we're going to be straight out. TV, television, and most entertainments are not family connectors. Mm. You need to pick and choose the real family connectors. Your associations, if you allow and, do and are not, remember the other night we spoke about protect, prepare, improve. If you're not prepared to protect your children from outside associations, unacceptable associations, you will erode your family connectedness. Mm. The quickest way to get your children to rebel against home is to allow them to just freely associate with others. Your association needs to be guarded. It needs to be in check. Remember, even within the church, unfortunately, 
just because we're in the church, it doesn't always mean that the that the association can be um, acceptable. We need to be looking. Be careful of the demands of others. Family, friends, and people who might need your help. We can sometimes make others dictate as to what is going on with our family. Mm. Um, that is a difficult one. It requires prayer. It requires thought. But again, don't let the good get in the way of the best. Overwork, parents. If we are so overly worked, you know what the biggest problem is? Not just that we don't have time, but even that when we do have maybe time in the day in terms of the clock, we can be too busy and therefore we are mentally distracted and you cannot connect with your family. It's that mental distraction that is the worst thing. Remember Jane's experience? Her dad was always there but not connected. Mm. Mentally distracted and not necessarily from overwork but we need to connect with our children. Worldly pleasure seeking. We need to be careful that we don't fall into the trap because that's the devil's greatest trap. Fun, 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 fun. We get addicted to fun. We get addicted to having a blast. We get addicted to adrenaline rush. No. Good, solid, home activities, family activities is what we really need. So folks, in conclusion, connected families don't just happen. Mm. We told you when we began the series, it begins with me. Parenting begins with mom and dad. We have a work to do. And we want to encourage you tonight. Some of you have young families. Some of you have not even started a family yet. You have a work to do. Apply your minds. Those of us whose family, whose um, parenting is coming to a close um, in terms of our children are still in home. Remember we said you're never not a parent until you breathe your last. But if you've made a mistake, go to God. Allow the Lord to pick you up. Make right with him. Make right with your children, with your family, and move forward. If we don't do that, we are allowing the devil to dictate what's happening in our homes. And why should we? We need to be the men that's going to stand up. We need to stand up and, and, and determine in our homes that from now on, my home is going to be a place where God is going to be honored. Not self, and the devil is not going to rule us. This is what we need in our families and in our homes. Nehemiah 4 verse 14 says, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, yeah. your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. Yeah. Fight for them because the devil is fighting for them. And we need to take up that battle and fight to get, to make sure that the devil doesn't get what he's after. Are you willing to do what it's going to take to connect your families to heaven? I want to encourage you. It's the best thing that you can do. Even if it costs you financially. Even if it costs you your reputation at church. Mm. You know, sometimes saying no to doing so many good things might not make the people at church happy, but it's going to make your wife and your children happy. Mm. We need to prioritize, friends. Are we willing to sacrifice our wants and sometimes even our needs so that we can fulfill God's high purpose for our families? Christ sacrificed everything, everything, so that you and I can have the life that God wants us to have. How dare we do less? And I want to remind you as we close, Steps to Christ 47, 48, you need to go and look at it. I want to remind you to go and look at Desire of Ages 690 to 693. That's the chapter on, Gethsemane, on Christ in Gethsemane. Go and read it. He's given us the perfect example of what it means to sacrifice, to give for others. I pray that no matter where you find yourself this evening, if you're confused about everything that's been said to you over this week, we understand. If you're afraid, if you feel you failed too much and how can I start, don't stop. Get on your knees and just tell the Lord exactly how you feel. Mm. He'll meet you where you are. That's how we started. We realized that we were in a mess. 
we'd seen DVDs and tapes of other families that had worked and gotten things right, and we wanted that for our kids. So what it looked like for us was on our knees, Lord, we're a mess. We want that. Please do what it takes to get me to that. Your inspiration and your understanding of what you said is not going to change you. It's what you're going to do on your knees. Folks, you and I need Christ in our lives, and our children need Christ. May God bless you as you choose to do that, and don't give up. Mm. You cannot give up, because heaven is not giving up. Mm. I read again today in Steps to Christ that we do not understand and we do not comprehend. She actually says we should take time to comprehend what heaven is doing to save you and me. The energy and the logistics that's going into saving you and me. And when we look at that, we'll see how much we are actually insulting heaven by how little we are responding. So may God move you and may God lift you. And I pray that our children will be the ones that can finish the work. Mm. May God bless us as we endeavor in this, in this way. I think tonight it will be good if you can maybe just as a group, let's just all kneel together and let's give, let's give three opportunities for prayer. Let's pray as a congregation and let's ask God to do the thing that needs to be done in us and then I'll close with prayer when we're done. Let's just all kneel together. Our Father in heaven, Lord, you are so good to us. Forgive us for not being s earnest and sincere and serious enough to come to you and to allow you to do the work in us. Lord, we recognize and we see that the great controversy is busy building at a rapid pace to the climax that your word tells us of. And Father, thank you that it is not upon us yet, for we are not ready. Lord, I pray that, that tonight we will understand our need of you. And that we'll understand even more than our need is that how heaven is so intently interested in each one of us. Father, we thank you that Jesus in Gethsemane, he thought about me and about Jen and about Chris and about every one of us in this room tonight. Father, he, it was us that he saw. And he was willing to say, Father, not my will, but thine be done for our sakes. Oh Lord, how can we not do that for our own spouses and our own children? Please, awaken us. Give us your spirit. Inspire us. And Lord, I thank you tonight in front of my friends here tonight for what you have done in my and Jane's life. Lord, you have been good to us. Mm. And it's because of your goodness to us that we have confidence in speaking of you. We desire your presence in our lives. But Lord, more than we desire for us, we plead with you tonight. Please, be with each one of our friends that are here this, this week. Everyone, Lord, you know their needs. If there's fear, if there's a sense of unworthiness, if there's too much of a sense of failure or challenges, life is too difficult, work demands too much, Lord, anything, please get it out of the way that we can all live the lives that you want us to live. Thank you that you will hear our prayers. Thank you that because of Jesus, we can have victory in everything and in all things. Thank you, Father, for your blessing us this week. Is our prayer in Jesus' name.